Good evening and welcome. I'm delighted to see all of you here. We're in for a very interesting evening and discussion. Couldn't be a more timely event, I think. Um, as you know, uh, on the 27th of June um, of this year, the ICC issued uh, a warrant for the arrest of the head of state, the then head of state, and commander of the armed forces in Libya, Muammar Gaddafi, his son, and then de facto Prime Minister Saif Gaddafi, and the then head of the military intelligence, uh, Abdullah al Senussi. Um, as you know, they were all charged with uh, counts of crimes against humanity, and uh, the denouement of the events was remarkable. So this is a fantastic opportunity for us to hear, as it were, from the horse's mouth what happened and what the relevance is. So I'm really delighted to welcome um, Mr. Luis Moreno Campo, who, as you know, is a prosecutor for the International Criminal Court, the first prosecutor unanimously um, uh, placed in that position uh, nearly nine years ago uh, in 2003. Prior to his time at the um, ICC, uh, Mr. Ocampo was well known and widely respected as an eminent um, human rights lawyer. Um, he, he did uh, trend-setting work in his home country of Argentina following the period of the military uh, dictatorship and prosecuted senior military commanders uh, successfully, um, securing the first convictions for uh, war criminals and, uh, and uh, for um, indictees of offenses since uh, the Nuremberg trials of World War II. He also prosecuted other um, senior military figures in Argentina and then went on to um, work in uh, the international community in various uh, posts at uh, the um, World Bank, the Inter-American uh, Development Bank and the UN before um, taking up his position at the International Criminal Court. Um, this evening, uh, Mr. Um, Ocampo is going to um, show um, a short video and uh, make some comments and then I think fully expects to engage in a lively discussion with all of you. So this is just by way of warning and enticement. And please join me in welcoming Mr. Luis Moreno Ocampo. Thank you very much for this kind invitation to be here. In fact, I'm working here because nine years ago, I was, on, was here, and they appointed me the prosecutor of the first permanent international criminal court. And as you know, this was an idea who was dreamed for 100 years and was finally implemented in 2003. And they gave me the privilege to be the first prosecutor. In those days, when I started, there were difficult, different perceptions. Some people were afraid of a very tough and rough prosecutor doing political prosecutions. Other people were thinking, you can do nothing. You will do nine years in the head doing nothing. Almost eight years and five months later, we are here, and we did more than nothing. And in some way, what I'd like to present to you, and I'd like if you can put the PowerPoint to be clear what, because I'd like to present to you a question. Uh, because I think in this new world, we need to redesign the legal framework. We are still working mostly on the national systems, who is important. But now we have a new reality. Uh, most of the big crimes have international connections. There are many <clears throat> criminal organizations committed crimes crossing boundaries. And we are not well equipped to that. So we had to start to think in this area of international relations, legal issues, and organized crime. And I took the Libya referral of of uh, the Security Council Libya referral, because I think it's a very significant point. I will make the point today. And go to the, ah, I have this. Yes. 
So um, the question is that. Is, as you know, the UN Security Council referred the Libya case to the ICC. Is it showing a new trend, a new justice trend, and um, in which the Security Council will respect the law and the law became a limit for the Security Council? Or is option one? Option two is a, oh, it's not a new trend, it's a normal Security Council political decision. In this case, they decide to punish Gaddafi, and then they use the International Criminal Court as a tool to punish. But it's no new trend, it's a normal trend. And that is the question I like you deciding. So I would do two things. I would like you voting, because I, look, I like to have some idea what people at Harvard think on this issue. And before you vote, as any vote, we need some kind of debate to understand what we are deciding. So why is it important for me? Uh, because I have a judicial mandate. So if the answer is one, it's no problem, because everyone is following the law, so the prosecutor has no problem. However, if the answer is two, it's different, because what are the implications for the prosecutor if the referral is based in a purely political interest? Should the prosecutor adjust to this political reality or not? Should keep the judicial mandate? So that is the question I'd like to present to you. Okay, so you have to be think on that because I like you voting on that. But before that, let me present basic information about the Rome Statute. Um, it's a treaty adopted by, voted by 120 countries, 20, 120 states, on July 1998. Uh, today, there are 119 countries who ratified the treaty. Okay? It's a treaty who is, the goal is to end the impunity of the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole, genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. And the goal is to contribute to the prevention of such crimes. It's important because the first time the international community defined their crimes were not just against national communities. These three crimes are against the international community. And so this is not just national crimes, they're global crimes. And they define a very unique model to face these crimes. First, the states who ratified the treaty adopted the duty to prosecute these crimes nationally. They established, in addition, a permanent international criminal court who will intervene if the state failed to intervene. So the system is a normal treaty, but the new difference is if the state fail, something happened. A court could independently decide to intervene. And the state are committed to guarantee respect for the court decision. So in this sense, it's not just a normal treaty. It's an integration of 119 states when one international criminal court to develop a, a global system of justice. I know in, we are living in a, in a time in which we need global governance, but we don't have a global government. And this model is the most innovative design to face this problem. Okay. <coughs> in addition, the treaty defines the element of the crimes, including genocide, basically the Genocide Convention, war crimes, Geneva, in the, uh, crimes against humanity were codified, adding some war crimes, some crimes against humanity, in particular in gender area, so it's a lot of development in the gender area, and the prosecutor has a special duty to prosecute the gender crimes, and also child soldiers is a new war crime. The statute defined that, and the, fact that the statute defined exactly when the court could trigger its jurisdiction, and the statute defined also a criminal procedures to manage trials when the court intervened. So that is the statute, okay? And let me show the map. This map show what in blue are the states who are members of this treaty, okay? As you see, it's all Europe who suffered the crimes during the Second World War, all South America who suffered the crimes in the 70s and 80s, 
is also Mexico and Canada, is almost all the non-Arab Africa, with few exceptions, Zimbabwe and other exceptions, Australia, New Zealand, Malaysia, Japan, South, Japan, South Korea, uh, Jordan, Georgia. And now, after the Arab Spring, Tunisia coming. So I think this is an institutional development in the, time of, in the time of Facebook. Because Facebook is interesting. I was, I was teaching at Harvard as a business professor when I was appointed in March 2003. Same days Facebook started in this place. And Facebook today has a community of 750 million people, one of the biggest countries in the world, if it's a country. But it's a community with no boundaries. It's a community different. It's a community based on interest. And that's a type of, of uh, institution the Rome Treaty is. It's a community of states based in a specific interest to have a collective action to control these massive atrocities. And interestingly, Facebook was very fast. 750 million people is very fast. The court is bigger. We have 2.3 billion people in the court. So it's an idea moving very fast. The issue of how fast it's moving is the Libya case. In the Libya case, suddenly, the wall is blue. Suddenly, the blue idea to have this commitment to stop massive atrocities became global. And is this a new trend, or is it just, I don't know, is it just a coincidence? That is a question for me, OK? Let me see, let me present to you, I have a video clip in which we put together the basic news, then you can follow what happened in the Libya situation. Can we go to the... He seized power in a military coup age 27. Brash and confident, he began to impose a pan-Arab anti-imperialist philosophy that won him friends and enemies. The people have gathered to express their revolution and say that they will not accept the camps and bases of colonialism on the Arab-Libyan people's soil. To the West, he was a bogeyman. He'd links to Yasser Arafat. There were claims he funded FARC rebels in Colombia. He armed the IRA in Northern Ireland. And there was the shooting dead of a policewoman outside the Libyan embassy in London during an anti-Gaddafi protest. Ronald Reagan called him a mad dog and in 1986 sent his jets to bomb Tripoli and Benghazi. It increased the rift between the West and Libya, but worse was to come. The 1988 Lockerbie bombing of Pan Am 103 marked the lowest point in relations between Libya and the West. Some claim Libya played no part, but Gaddafi was held responsible and sanctions were imposed, which crippled the country's economy. The invasion of Iraq brought a rethink in Tripoli and led to Gaddafi's rehabilitation in the global community. Quietly, behind the scenes, he admitted his country had a nuclear weapons program. When he agreed to international inspections, he got a frosty handshake from Tony Blair in a tent in the desert. Gaddafi was no longer considered dangerous. He was eccentric and became a colourful turn at global gatherings. His oil meant he was accepted. He was regarded as a stabilising force, even if he did crush internal opposition and ran the country as the single power. In the end, he enjoyed a better relationship with the countries who once loathed him than the people he thought loved him. Libya deserves a permanent seat in the Security Council because of its great service to international peace and security. So he took the ceremonial gavel and will be the chair of the African Union for the next year.
Distinguished members of the General Assembly of the United Nations, in the name of the African Union, I would like to welcome you and I do call that this gathering will be a historic one in the world and the history of the world. And in the name of the General Assembly that is presided by Libya now in the name of the African Union. ...of systematic murder by his regime of its own people. It happened in the city British forces are now trying to protect. We've evidence of Gaddafi's men firing at unarmed protesters. Come into your city. We will ask you to show no mercy for the traitors. We are going to hunt them down wherever they are. We're going to track them down one by one. Uh, I can tell you today there is a big massacre. While uh, the people uh, were marching uh, to the cemetery, uh, bearing 30 martyrs on their way, they were hit with live ammunition in front of the army brigade in uh, Birka. And four demonstrators were killed. There, there is a big massacre happening. We hear every, every uh, few minutes that there are people killed. Resolution 1970 includes an arms embargo, asset freeze, and travel bans for longtime Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi and his associates. It also refers Gaddafi to the International Criminal Court for alleged crimes against humanity. For the first time ever, the Security Council has unanimously referred an egregious human rights situation to the International Criminal Court. Today, 3rd of March 2011, the Office of the Prosecutor decided to open an investigation into alleged <coughs> crimes against humanity committed in Libya since 15 of February. I am honored to report to this council on the Office of the Prosecutor activities in furtherance of Resolution 1970. I would request the judges to issue arrest warrants against three, against three individuals who appear to bear the greatest criminal responsibility for crimes against humanity committed in the territory of Libya since 15 February 2011. Based on the evidence collected, the prosecution has applied to pretrial chamber one for the issuance of arrest warrants against Muammar, Mohammed, Abu, Minyar, Gaddafi, Saif, Al-Islam, Gaddafi, and Abdullah, Al-Sanusi. The judges will decide. The chamber hereby issues one, a warrant of arrest for Muammar Mohammed Abu Minyar Gaddafi, two, a warrant of arrest for Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, three, a warrant of arrest for Abdullah al-Senusi. The Office of the Prosecutor will conduct further investigations. First, allegation of rapes. Second, allegation of killings of sub-Saharan Africans considered mercenaries. And third, war crimes.
ونحن للعالم مقتل القذافي. We will announce to the world. We announce. We announce to the world that Muhammad Gaddafi has been killed. على يد الثوار. On the hands of the revolutionaries. وطويت إلى غير رجعة صفحة القذافي ونظامه واستبداده عن ليبيا وعن وجه الأرض. And Gaddafi's tyranny and dictatorship has been finally ended, and this chapter has been closed for Libya and for all the world. Gaddafi's son Saif al Islam once vowed to fight and die on Libyan soil. Reuters has learned that he has proposed surrendering to the International Criminal Court in The Hague, where he is wanted for war crimes. So, you have now a summary. Can you go back to the PowerPoint? So, you have a summary of what happened, and this happened this year, all of this in February. And let me back to the question what do you think? Is this a new trend that, uh, you go to my question, is it the questions? Is it a new, is it a new justice trend who's imposing to the Security Council? Or is it just business as usual? I like someone representing one of the two positions. Who is the volunteer? Who can present the idea that it's a new trend of justice? It's not justice at all. It's not justice at all. No. It's, what is? Okay. And Obama and Sarkozy just blew up uh, Gaddafi's retreating uh, caravan, which had white flags on it. But the, the now you're talking about the, the circumstances of his death. That is a different issue. No, we, but. Also, I, also, the president needs to actually get uh, authority from the Congress before they start blowing up other countries. Okay, so, but it's not at all connected with the International Criminal Court. We well, this, is just, this is just an organization that's, you know, supposed to implement imperial policies, which is what has no bearing on real justice. Ah, okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so, you will suggest the issue number two. The, it's a tool of the political leaders implementing political decisions. Okay. Other position? Yes? I think that also the threatening to not be easy. And I think it's possible to see the Arctica and the Turkey war as an indication that we're developing a political situation. And it might be the justice trend to see this as a threat to not be the right thing. But I think in my opinion, it would be great if that's true. But I'm not sure if the government is able to hear it. I think that. Sorry? I think there were political reasons. But basically, the trend is a similar trend. It's a political trend. It's not just a trend here. Yeah, you like it, just a trend, but it's not. Okay. Yes. Okay, just to, to help those. Yes. So it's a political tool to attack African leaders. Thank you. 
But what define a political condition? I think would be political if I present the case with no evidence. Or if I say, look, I don't know if Gaddafi ordered the crime, but he's the leader. That's a political decision. But in my case, we present evidence showing that Gaddafi, Muammar, and Saif were planning how to quell the rebellion. They were planning, they had to shoot, to shoot them to be sure they are not escalating. And they were thinking the army could reject the plan. That's why they decided to hire mercenaries. And Saif's personal mission was to hire the mercenaries and help them to come. So, and then we have the evidence they ordered the shooting. We have evidence that Al Sanusi was in the planning and was the one implementing the plans, shooting the civilians in Benghazi on the street. And we have more evidence showing they continue doing that. And in addition to that, they were persecuting those considered dissidents, alleged dissidents, and abducting them and torturing them. So we have evidence of all of that. So that, for me, is a judicial activity. It's not political activity. The fact that Mr. Gaddafi or Saif were political actors is not transforming the case in political trial. It's, they are political actors. And in fact, the role of the court is to put limits to the political actors. You cannot commit atrocities to gain power or retain power. That's the message. So we are trying to put the legal limits to the political actors who are committing crimes. The question I am presenting to you is different. Is okay, Security Council is in charge of peace and security in the world. And they have a political mandate that they are implementing politically normally. And that creates a perception of the standards. Many people think it's wrong. But in any case, that's why I'm asking you. The fact that they react so fast is showing a justice trend who is coming, or it's just the normal issue. To help you, I, okay, I, because I, I was imagining that justice trend would be not so clear for you. So I, I prepare a little this one. OK. Why you can see a justice trend? You can see even before I took office, the Security Council passed a resolution preventing the court to intervene or to investigate individuals who belong to non parties involved in the peacekeeper operation. And this was a resolution promoted by US in the Bush administration. And this resolution was confirming next year, the following year, 2003. And was not confirmed in 2004. When they went to discuss in 2004, there were no more majority for this resolution. The, when the court started operation, this resolution stopped it. Then, 2005, the UN Commission of Inquiry presented a report on Darfur. And they recommend to reserve, refer the case to the International Criminal Court. And suddenly, the state start to debate that. For three months, they were discussing that. And finally, 11 votes in favor, four abstentions, no veto. The case was referred. 2011, as you saw, <clears throat> uh, nine days after the, the beginning of the killings, Security Council decided to do justice in Libya. And in this case, there were no debate about who will do justice. It was the International Criminal Court. And in this case, were 15 votes, unanimity, including China, Russia, South Africa, uh, India, Lebanon. Okay? So, and that is the argument that, okay, here is a trend, it's changing. The security council is more and more understanding the need to do justice, and then we have to understand and review how we understand the global political issues. Okay? This is the argument in favor of the idea of justice trend. I don't see a lot of enthusiasm for it, but it's presented. Yes. Some of them. 
I fully agree with you. In fact, it's the first time members of the Arab League request one of the leaders to resign. Never happened before. And they are reacting because of the crimes. Yes, I agree with you. This, is, this could be part of this new trend. Yes? Ah, you, you talk. But uh, do you hear any security council referral of the, of the Obama situation? My, no, look, I will explain to you that. Obama has look, to sorry? No, but you have, a security, you have a security council resolution in the Libya case. I had two chances to intervene in the blue countries and try to find US or Pakistan in the blue countries, or Zimbabwe or Iraq. Exactly. That's why security. That's why the video I show you with the boats. So why have you not tried to move Obama? Yes. Ah, yes. No, I, the legal issue is the following. I can have to. Can you listen to me? Sorry. No. It's okay, it's okay. If, okay. No, I, I like to focus, okay, I, I, I prefer to, I was thinking it would be more organized this debate. Uh, I like to go back because I really believe, okay, I know you, you say, you talk three times and it's clear that you believe option number two. I try, I try, you're not listening. I tell you because I have no jurisdiction. You understand what is jurisdiction? Criminal jurisdiction is something that the Security Council can provide to me in the white countries. They did not, so I cannot do it. In the Libya case, they did that, you saw in the video. So that's why I cannot intervene in Libya. No, it's okay. Go. Yes. It's, it's a, an attempt to end the sanctuary or the, um, that heads of state have in, pros, you know, in persecuting their own people. But that the Security Council, the entity that refers cases to the International Criminal Court, five of whom are permanent members, yeah. three of them are not signatories to the yeah. Rome Treaty. So yeah. it's like the police force that's rounding up these people and referring them to the court is not subject to the jurisdiction of the court itself. So that's where the flaw is that a lot of people see. The members, the United States, Russia, China, are not subject to the Rome Treaty. They're not members of, they have, they're not signatories to the Rome Treaty, but they vote to refer other members to the court. Yes, okay. and you see so that as a political, yes, it's a problem because they are not subject themselves to the law, but they subject others to the law. And in this sense, you don't see a justice trend, you see a political trend. Yes. Okay, yeah, yes. Come and stand at the mic, please, so everybody can hear. Can you go to the mic? I'm very optimistic about the Libya case because you know it came to the criminal court in such a short time. Uh, now you know in this age where information is going fast and it's shared, but you know the whole world uh, get information so fast, and uh, there is a sense of justice. Uh, like uh, before the internet age, we never got an opportunity to know about what is happening around. Now we know what uh, what is happening around, and we want to do something, and we don't know because there are sovereignty issues and stuff. But now. You know, first of all, the existence of International Criminal Court itself is such, a, uh, such an optimistic trend in today's world. And on top of it, the Libya ca case came to the Criminal Court in such a short time. I think it's highly optimistic. The new sense of justice that's uh, happening in the minds of people around the world is kind of trans getting translated into action. I mean, there is a system here. It might not be perfect. It will have its flaws. But the thing is, we have a system, and it will, you know, all of us can uh, kind of take it into the next level. So I, I definitely go for the first one. I think we are not ready to tolerate any atrocity. 
Okay, but what you are saying is internet is creating a new scenarios where the citizens are understanding what's happening, and this would put pressures on the countries who maybe they are not ready to sign the treaty, but they are ready to send the case of Libya. And this is showing there is a justice trend pushed by the internet system who is giving more information to you, the citizens. But if you like to stop crime, you need institution. It's not enough to talk, oh, it's bad. Yes, you need institution reacting. And now, because they see exists, maybe the combination of the system that you see and the citizens is pushing the Security Council to follow this justice trend, maybe. Yeah. So my question is, do you intend to hold uh, Israeli officials accountable for the actions that they committed in uh, December of 2008 and January 2009 against uh, the Gaza Strip? OK, we'll talk after, OK? <laughs> because it's a completely different topic. Let me think. I'd like to have one clarity on this issue I'm presenting. And I, I think we can, we, it's an academic community, probably we can focus on the questions and answer the question, and then we can follow a different issue, okay? Let me focus on this. I hope that Kennedy School people can focus on one question, discuss, debate, and find a conclusion, no? That is what we are trying to do here. So, are you leaving or are you talking? Uh, so you mentioned that we need a governance system for the whole world, and we don't have one. No, I say, we need global governance. Right. But we, we, will, we will not have a global government. Right. So what I say is this ICC is a model to have common rules with a court enforcing it who can allow states independent to work together. That is a, it's a new concept that I love is the Kenyan school start to think on that because it's a new concept. We had nothing like this before. And then we, it's a, in some way, it's something making the world less primitive. Right. In, a, in a primitive society, if you, are not, if you live in Boston, and you imagine Boston with no police, your neighbor stealing your bicycle, what do you do? You have to go and steal their bicycle. So with police, you can go to the police and my neighbor to steal my bicycle. So the institution solve your problem. And we have no institution before, and now we have an institution, okay? So it's like in, in September 11, you have no institution to go to do justice in Bin Laden. Now, <coughs> you can choose a different path in a, in a new situation. You can, request the court intervention to investigate Bin Laden and prosecute him. So it's a new institution. How is affecting this new institution with the fact the Security Council, who is a political body, that's the question for me. I'd like to have clarification. I hope you can give me clarification. Uh, I was going to agree with you on this point. <laughs> no, no, wait. So I'm voting, for, I'm voting for one, but, and the reason is, is as you say, uh, that without these structures, these law structures, things are way too expensive and primitive, and we do have uh, apparently an innate revulsion to primitivism, and uh, I believe. And we have some sense that we want to move forward and become better organized, and we have these practical reasons as well, because allowing people like Gaddafi to run amok uh, is very dangerous. Yeah, in fact, it's interesting to see Gaddafi was so powerful, no? Gaddafi was the Greek Council, African Union, General Assembly President, one of the richest men in the world, and this guy suddenly was put on justice. Yeah, something, something happening here. Uh, interrupt yes. for a second, and just ask people, if you wouldn't mind, since we are in Q&A mode, just to identify yourselves, please, and just to make one question, and as you know, a question... A comment, yeah. Go back and comment, in fact. Yeah, okay, well, but just keep it brief, because there are a lot of people who want to talk. So just identify yeah. yourself and keep your comment brief. Thank you. Uh, law school. Um, I want to offer an argument for uh, interpretation number one, which is that Gaddafi is the second sitting head of state who's been indicted. Um, and so when we think of political motivations, we think of, you know, regional affiliations, et cetera, but I think... Um, Something that's um, uh, ignored or mitigated or avoided in number two is the idea that these, these states that would vote um, for, uh, for investigation of Gaddafi or it, of the situation, but with the potential of having it arise that it's Gaddafi, especially given the precedent in Darfur, are themselves heads of state. So it's, um, it's difficult to think of heads of state making a political decision that may come back to bite them but it's more easy to uh, conceive of when it's a justice-based decision. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go. Uh, sir, uh, I'm Ali. I'm from Iran. Uh, welcome. Uh, 
so uh, as far as I follow, I used to follow uh, ICC uh, history, I know that uh, each case brings a new foundation for, uh, for justice and for law. Uh, do you see this case as a, as a that you prosecuted a head of a state in a, uh, about his own uh, country um, in, a, in a state that hasn't signed this uh, ICC uh, uh, status Roma before? Uh, do you see this as a foundation for the further uh, cases like in Yemen, maybe, I don't know, Yemen, uh, Israel, or other places? No, I, I have no jurisdiction on these countries in the, that you mentioned. So the Penal Security Council, it's a Security Council decision to give jurisdiction to the court in one of the 94 states who are still not members of the Rome Treaty. So I have automatic jurisdiction in 119 states, and I have eventual jurisdiction if the Security Council, using its powers in charge of peace security, decided to do justice. As the same way they did, they create the past, Security Council created a tribunal. Yugoslavia and Rwanda were created by the same authority. Now what they are doing is providing referral to the SEC. So in, that, in this way it became an evolution because we have a permanent court now. The Security Council can refer. How this interact is for me an issue I like to discuss, I like to understand. How this world is managed? Is Security Council making more legal decisions, respect, making more clear this line that states, people in, the, in, in power cannot commit atrocities to remain in power? Or is political, it's just everything is random and political. That's the question I'm trying to understand. In particular, because the second aspect, is this totally political, what I should do when I receive a political decision? Go. Mr. Simmer Singh, and I'm here at the Kennedy School. Um, to go back to your question, I wish it was number one, but I see a trend where I think it is actually the second um, option, and I'd use the case of child soldiers. So there is a clear precedent at the ICC that of the first case was um, held against the recruitment and use of child soldiers, but there hasn't been a single referral from the Security Council, despite having repeated evidence from countries such as Burma, Myanmar, um, Colombia, etc. So I think in that case it is a political decision um, and the Security Council is sort of choosing which cases they want to push forward and refer and which ones they, they don't. So you see, Security Council still work in the same way, they choose when, and if, in fact, you can say, is Security Council attribution decide when they believe justice will help and when not. But in any case, showing it's still not a justice trend, it's still a political trend. That's Unfortunately. Point. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for your contribution. My name is Marissa. Um, I have a question using this dichotomy you put up here between new and normal um, to talk about the new or the term that's gained increasing significance, which is the responsibility to protect as something that's been newly implemented and newly important. And I guess I would wonder, given the historical, political problem, politically problematic nature of humanitarian intervention and in looking at human rights, the responsibility to protect is a new term, a new doctrine with force, but then your opinion on how different that really is from the politically problematic way in which humanitarian intervention has always been looked at. This is get, getting attention as something new and exciting, and I guess I'm wondering your opinion on how new and different it is, or if it's just a new term. Okay, but that was the question I'm doing to you. <laughs> exactly. No, not me. I, I, I am just a prosecutor. You are the theorist. You, you, are the, <laughs> you are the guy who has studied theory. You are the guy to describe the world. So I am, I am hoping that in my meeting I'll have clarity if where is the world. As you say, you can say Libya referral is aligned with responsibility to protect, who is a new trend, and Libya mm -hmm. referral, in fact, is showing the responsibility to protect is flying, is moving ahead. Mm -hmm. So you can say that if you like. I don't know. I'm asking you. <coughs> okay, I think he's before. I think so. Uh, Zach Rosenfeld, I'm MPP1 at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, my question just had to do with, uh, specifically with the US um, and its relationship with the ICC. You know, we've seen in the last 10 or 15 years a really stunning turnabout with the US. They started totally against ICC, wouldn't work with them at all. Darfur, they were willing to abstain from the Security Council and allow them to recommend <coughs> Darfur to the ICC. And in this last case with Libya, they actually voted with 
Security Council unanimously with China, as you mentioned. So I'm, I'm wondering, like, what do you think is motivating this change? I mean, going back to your dichotomy, but also like, what pressures do you think are coming to bear on countries like the United States and China, who have been traditionally been sort of enemies of the ICC? No, the point you're making is exactly the point I am presenting as a maybe justify a new trend, because as you say, US adjusted, China adjusted, Russia adjusted, so they are moving to a different position. So maybe now we are living in a different world in which Security Council is taking in consideration and weighing different crimes and legal limits. And that is for me the question to analyze. The reasons, it's difficult for me, I, can, it, I hope you can do the research, not me, I'm just blind prosecutor. It was before me. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Um, my name is Christian Schiller and I'm with the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Great. And um, I would actually say it's something in between, you know. Okay. When we say maybe yes, there's a new justice trend, but, but it's not operating in a political vacuum. Um, when the security council is referring a situation to you, um, I guess they're not expecting to have a couple of acquittals coming out of this case. So there's, I do see a clear political agenda at the same time. <coughs> I guess according to the statute, you, do have, you would have the power to say, you know, there's no reasonable basis to proceed. You know, the, your security council, you refer jurisdiction to me, but I can just do not see any responsibility. And also on top of that, what we've seen in the documentary too, I do believe that even within the Rome Statute, there's plenty of room for you that you have to think about what are the political implications of my strictly judicial okay. activity. So, I mean, I, I, do, I do give it, or I do see that, you, you know, while you're doing your work according to the Rome Statute, of course, you know, sort of what is at the end of the project? In the end, you have a regime, regime change. So even though you say I'm sticking closely to the letter of the Rome Statute, <coughs> my actions, my judicial actions have a political impact that I must make, maybe might, might consider. And maybe even the Rome Statute gives me some kind of leeway to interpret that. Is it in the interest of justice? Is it a grave enough crime? Who do I, who do I target with my prosecution? So I do say yes, strictly speaking, first of all, it's a judicial trend, but it is not operating in a political vacuum and it always has a political implication, whatever you do. Either you turn down a case or you prosecute. Okay but the Security Council referred the case to me, they don't know if I will prosecute Gaddafi or a captain. They have no idea. So maybe they, they like the idea to punish Gaddafi, but they don't know. And the political issue is normally in the past, they were just ignoring the crimes. And now, suddenly, they say someone has to review the crimes. In this sense, it could be a new trend. Thank you. Um, my name is Julie, and I'm from the law school. Um, I also find it hard to make a clear choice between the two, although you've had to make those choices, I doubt for um, answer number one. Um, but I'm wondering if these two options could be to some extent um, not so contradictory. I mean, what you, you showed in the Security Council's de decision show that um, it's from this new political will that we can get this new justice train. Um, like be strengthened and make it possible for these um, well new examinations and prosecutions from your office. And um, so I believe that it might become more and more normal actually that these crimes are not accepted by the um, well international community and the political will that's behind. So we might have a new political will at least for these new issues that we're facing, we've faced with Libya, but um, this might actually go further. And I know that you're very optimistic, and it happens that I'm too when it comes to, um, well, international uh, justice. So this brings me to a question to you, sir. Um, do you think that this is something that will, that can go, go back? Can the US um, say no to the next Libya case that happens? Or will they feel bound by that and by, you know, the international well, sort of consensus that we've had. Okay, that's an interesting question. Probably you can take consideration that some people say Syria is similar to Libya, and it, no one is referring to the Syria case. So maybe the president is not such a big president. But also people can say, look, but it's wrong, because in the Syria situation, there was a presidential statement condemning the crimes. What the opposition, and that's why there's no agreement to do something else, because the opposition to this resolution because, as you know, it was a veto in the Syria situation. Because Russia, China, you, 
India, South Africa, are unhappy with the military inter NATO military intervention in Libya. So the real dissidence in Libya is about the military intervention. They were thinking the NATO operation went beyond the limits. And that was a blocking part. So it's difficult to say exactly what is the difference between Syria and Libya, but you can debate. I, I'd like to finish, I'd like to, can, can you finish with the person who are in the micro and then I need a vote because I'd like to make a second little point and finish. I have a question. Um, some Libyan officials, they said they want to try the former regime's officials in Libya and based on the domestic, you know, yeah. Libya, Libyan's law. So what is the ICC positions? Do you think they have this capacity? And are you gonna help them? Do you then, you're gonna provide them with the legal and technical uh, yeah, you know, assistance? It's a slightly different. And why, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, just the, uh, yeah. if, you know, if I may. And why the International <coughs> Committee ask the NTC, the, uh, the Libyan National uh, uh, Transitional uh, Council, to investigate the death of Gaddafi, which is its might war crimes committed here, because Gaddafi might be being executed without trial. Yeah. No one asked them to investigate, you know, the the crimes that committed by Gaddafi. So, and the last things, do you think the ICC can bring justice better than they do, or better than, you know, the local capacity? And you know, given the, the experience with international courts like the ITCY or ITCR or Hariri Tribunal, which takes a long time, and many people. They get frustrated with this very long, and uh, too long a process. Okay, but in this case, we, we had a, a reward in, after two months and a half. So we, we start in March, we make a request in May, in June we have the reward issue. So in two months and a half we have a reward, so we're not slow. Uh, can Libyan do it? Depends. Right now they have no case. If they do a case, they have to challenge the admissibility of the case before the ICC. They are promising to investigate Gaddafi conditions of the Gaddafi death. That's what they're promising, and we follow that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jed Schwartz, uh, Somerville. Uh, suppose that the Security Council wanted to in, uh, investigate a national, uh, a crime with which a national who belonged uh, from, from one of the five permanent members of the Security Council uh, was associated, like the United States, for example, or, you know, or Britain. Uh, w would it be in, uh, advisable for the, you know, for the, 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 the host of that national to recuse themselves from the Security Council vote authorizing the investigation? Uh, <coughs> If they have veto power, they can veto the decision, that's it. Yes. Sure. If they have veto power, they can veto the eventual decision, and that's it. So the country would decide. It's not, it's not my role. The country would decide, but it might be in the, in the interest of legitimating the country's position in the world to recuse themselves, yes? I mean, it might yes. be. Yes, it's the decision. So you have to convince people how to vote. Are you voting for one or two? Uh, I'm looking at, if you're looking at Libya alone, in the case of Libya, I'm not sure we have enough evidence of the case to justify the argument for a new justice trend. A trend would need more than one case, especially uh -huh. being Libya, that is a sensitive case and would have a lot of international attention. So I think we would need to have more to justify that Libya is a new justice trend. Maybe if you're looking at it with the idea that there's a referral in Darfur and this piece, then maybe we'll be make, we might make an argument that there's a new justice trend. But if you're only looking at Libya, I find that we do not have enough on the table as it is, even though we will say that China, Russia, US, the countries that are not parties to the Rome Statute voted for it. I still don't think we have enough to justify so you an vote argument. Two. You vote number two. <laughs> I'll go with what Christian said. It's somewhere I in between. Here, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I was forced to eat, I would vote for two. If okay. I had to choose one, so I, I'd go for two. Okay. Yes, okay. But we have to, because I like to vote. Go. You like to talk? Talk? And then we prepare for uh, both. Sir, I I'd, like, I'd like to go before you. Ah, yeah. So when I was pondering this question, I tried it. My name is Adam. I'm a, st a student here at the Kennedy School. I was trying to think of a case which you prosecuted, which. The target was an incredibly political figure, and I'm thinking of Joseph Kony and the LRA. 
So it's not Qaddafi, he's not a member of the international community, he's isolated from the political community within his, within his country. So when I think about it that way, I think about it towards a trend, that his decision to target Joseph Kony might have not been a very political decision, but then I think of the implications, what has that done to a peace process, and what are the political consequences of a, of a, of a justice trend, and whether that's been an impact on him coming out of the bush or even undoing that. And also, um, Museveni, the, a person, you know, the Roman Statue Conference was in Kampala, I believe. Um, he's saying that we might not bring Kony to the ITC even though there is an ICC warrant for him. So I see it as a trend towards a person who is um, not a member of the political community um, but, but has committed some serious violations. So in between, I guess. So I see this doubt on this justice trend because even other cases. Okay, you? <laughs> um, Christopher from the Fletcher School and uh, originally from Kenya. It's neither. Um, okay. I, justice does not begin with the ICC. I mean, if, you, if we answer one, it means that Nuremberg, ICTY, ICTR, and that's talk, we're talking about retributive justice. If it's restorative justice, we're talking about numerous truth commissions. So justice does not begin, and this is not a new trend. This is a trend that has been there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's, you, you, you vote for number one. The trend is bigger. Ah, it's not, but it's a justice trend. It's not new. It's a, it's a no justice. It's a justice trend. It's not new justice, but it's a justice. A justice trend from Nuremberg. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. After this debate, we have. I like to have a vote, and then I like to have some remark before we finish. So, in the, can you <clears throat> raise the hands? Those who vote for number one, it's a justice trend. New, new, okay. It's a justice trend. The Security Council will now. Respect. Wow. Can you help me from this? This half? I got this half. Yes. Wait. This is 11. Okay. Oh, sorry. I didn't see up there yet. No, you're there. No, but I'm not there. 11, 14. How many you have? 14. Can you take the vote from between 1 and 2? No, no, no. It's a new. It's a complete new vote. No. OK. No, it's plus. So OK. Now, those who vote for the second option, it's, it's, an, it's a normal political decision. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, Yeah, is a, the result is 40, 40, uh, 30, 33? Is this a two? Two. 33 against 49. No, no, because it's this. 33, 33 for number one is a justice trend. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, 49 is a normal political business, OK? So basically, the Kennedy expression in this not very scientific sample is uh, that uh, there is a normal business. So if this is true, and this is, in fact, my, for me, the most important question, do, what's the implication for me as a prosecutor? Is it just a political referral? So the question is, uh, should I adjust to the political conditions, in, including the negotiation area, asking them what to do, or should do just do my normal judicial activity. I'd like to present you uh, William Burg White, who was, is a professor in Pennsylvania. It's an fo ongoing forum on discussing this issue now in the UCLA forum. And you can read what he said. No? It's basically, he's expressing the idea, the justice, the prosecutor just doing, pretending to be judicial is wrong. It's losing opportunities. So this is this, his position. No? And this is particularly true if you have security council resolution based on political decision. And uh, my feeling, my idea was even if security council is a political decision, even in that, first, my mandate is the same. My mandate is judicial. And then 
in particular, it's a political decision. Security Council has the monopoly of political decisions. They have to make the political decision. They can stop my investigation if they believe I interfere with justice. But I have to be remain judicial. I have to remain doing just investigation, evidence, law, cases. That's my job. And that will help Security Council to make political decisions. Because the day they want to do justice, they know they will do justice because they will refer the case to us and we'll just do justice no political decisions. And that's for me, that's why the debate on the first debate is important to clarify, maybe you're right, maybe it's still, basic security council is still a political body making political decisions. But when they refer the case to ICC, ICC has to intervene judiciary. And, and that's for me is the trend we have to confirm. Whatever is the origin of the decision, why, whatever, the, whatever the reason they decide to refer the case, the answer of the I think should be judicial, not based in political consideration. And that's it for me, a clear position. And therefore, the problem is, and that's why I was trying to make this point to the Kennedy School, because I think it's the most important issue, it's not the prosecutor who should adjust to the peace effort or the political negotiations. The other actors should adjust and learn how the judicial process will work and how they can negotiate. We need a negotiator. But the negotiation when, when Gaddafi is indicted is okay. Maybe you can go to Zimbabwe or Belarus and, and escape justice, but you cannot remain in power. Because the prosecutor unveiled the fact that they were using massive killings to stay in power, to remain in power. So if you are really protecting civilians, a negotiation should not include keeping Gaddafi or Saif or Sanusi in power. And that is the type of information the prosecutor unveiled. And the judicial work has to be give this to the political leaders and political leaders take this in consideration. Or you can go further. There was no mandate in NATO to provide arrest operation. And maybe it was better because the, the operation was so, uh, there's so many discussion. But maybe, the best solution would be not to send, if we were, send command to arrest individuals at the top of the court. Or I think also, if security council understand the meaning of justice, you can take this Libya case and discuss in other conflicts in countries who are not members of the ICC, you can discuss with them what conditions are and what conditions to be implemented in order not to be referred to ICC. So Security Council can do a better use of the existence of ICC to manage peace and security in the world. And no one is thinking on that. People are focusing eventually on the prosecutor himself. And no one is thinking on the other actors. And that is for me a problem. And that's why I was trying to challenge you with these ideas to see if you, can, if you can start to develop theories and framework to those who are running mediations, who those who are running political uh, decisions, in particular to manage conflict, to start to understand better how the law could be a new way to protect people and to make peace and security. And that is my hope, and I hope the Kennedy School could provide some ideas because the world really needs and peace is not luxury, peace is a need. So we really need ideas from the Kenyan school to clarify what, how security council should work. Thank you very much. You do some final comments?